the acoustics of the resonant consonants, also known as sonorant consonants, such as the glides, liquids, and nasals, is similar to the acoustics of vowels. There should be periodicity visible in the wide band spectrogram as a vertical striping representing the glottal pulses, or in a narrow band spectrogram as horizontal striping representing the harmonics. There will be formants from the resonances of the vocal tract that are visible in a wide band spectrogram as a dark horizontal bands. In the case of resonant consonants, the first formant is lower than it is for most vowels due to a narrow constriction of the vocal tract for consonants, making a Helmholtz resonator shape. There's also lower amplitude than most vowels, again due to the narrow constriction, which dampens the amount of uh, noise that resonates out of the mouth. In general, amplitude is inversely related to tongue and jaw height in speech production, so low vowels tend to be louder than high vowels, for example, and uh, continuing that resonant consonants are even quieter, meaning they will show up lighter on the spectrogram, their formant frequencies may not be as dark or as obviously visible. For the glides y and w, sometimes also called semivowels, they are acoustically very similar to e and u, with slightly more extreme articulations, high front or high back, that are briefer and more transitional. So for y, we would expect to see a low f1 and a high f2, like for a high front vowel, and for w, we would expect to see a low f1 and a low f2, like for a high back and rounded vowel. The glides don't have a steady state in them like vowels though, so they will be visible only in transition to a following vowel. Here for example, we have a spectrogram of four syllables, and in this spectrogram we have y and w onsets followed by e and u vowels, then the question is uh, do we have the sequence yi, wu, we, yu? or the sequence wu, yi, yu, we. Given the similarity in articulation and acoustics between the y and the e, and the w and the u, for those syllables we would expect to see not a lot of formant transition, whereas uh, a production like we, going from the um, w like a high back vowel, to the E like a high front vowel, we would see an extreme transition in the second formant going from uh, low for the back to high for the front, and then for something like U we would expect the reverse, a high second formant uh, going to a low second formant um, as you go from the forward Y to the back U. As a result, then, the answer here must be A. The first two syllables show very little transition. The second syllables show uh, a lot of transition. Articulation for Y and W uh, is just like E and U, so the jaw will need to be raised, as it will be for all consonants, to uh, help um, raise the other articulators to make constrictions or closers closures. Um, in the case of the y, the mylohyoid genioglossus, posterior vertical muscles, and anterior transverse muscles will all work to move the front part of the tongue uh, up into the oral cavity near the alveolar ridge. In the case of w, stylogossus, posterior transverse muscles, will be used to bunch the tongue body nearer to the velum, and the orbicularis oris muscle will be used to uh, around the lips. For the liquid L, also called a lateral, the styloglossus helps raise the tongue body up and back. The superior longitudinal muscle raises the tongue tip but unlike in a comparable uh, stop that we'll see later, um, the tip only will lightly touch the alveolar ridge so there isn't a complete closure. 
The transverse muscles help narrow the tongue body and blade. This both bunches the tongue in the back and keeps the sides of the tongue from touching in the front, allowing that lateral airflow around the sides of the tongue. Uh, the acoustics, because of this lateral airflow, are not particularly well understood. There's a relatively low F1 and F2 for la, like in high back vowels. Uh, but the F3, the third formant, which we haven't really done much with previously, uh, is uh, somewhat high compared to the other formants. It's possible that the mid-sagittal closure and the lateral airstream create a dead airspace, sometimes referred to as an anti-formant, where energy is absorbed in the normal range for F3. And as a result, uh, third formant energy is visible only at higher frequencies, uh, or basically it's the fourth formant, but you can't see the third formant because of that um, filtering absorption pattern created by the dead end airspace. In the case of the liquid Ra, also called a rhotic constant, and these properties also apply to the rhotic vowels, uh, the er vowels, we have lip rounding by the orbicularis oris, the tongue body raised up and back by the styloglossus muscle, the tongue root pulled downward and backward by the hyoglossus muscle, and the transverse muscles working to enhance these constriction both in the region of the tongue dorsum and in the tongue root by bunching the tongue. This creates the uh, bunched R articulation, which is the most typical articulation. There is also a retroflex R articulation, which is less common or used only in some articulatory circumstances. Uh, this is actually a topic of current research. In the case of the uh, acoustics, the liquid R has a low F1 and a low F2 like a high back vowel, but additionally it has a particularly low F3. One analysis of what's happening here is the uh, lip rounding, the tongue dorsum raising, and also the tongue root retraction end up creating three different bottle shapes in the articulation, uh, giving us a third Helmholtz resonator as part of the articulatory configuration, and therefore a relatively uh, low or surprisingly low third formant um, because of that third Helmholtz resonance. Um, so given these three constrictions, the articulation of R, the R, is pretty complicated, much like the L, and uh, these are some of the articulations that are learned the last by um, children learning English or hardest for non-native speakers of English to learn unless they already have these sounds in their language. Here we have spectrograms of the liquids, uh, both the R and the L in an A vowel context. The A vowel is visible in terms of the high F1 and F2 relatively close to it, with a separately visible voice bar um, because it does not overlap with F1. The question here is, are we looking at ara a la or a la a ra? The primary difference acoustically between ra and la is in the third formant, F3. It's relatively high for the L and relatively low for the R. So as we find the third formant in these spectrograms, we see it stays relatively high and level on the left, whereas it dives down significantly to get near to F2 uh, on the right. Uh, so the answer must be that we have a la followed by a ra. The last of the resonant consonants are the nasal consonants. These consonants articulated, are articulated just like stops that are at the same place of articulation, uh, so those articulations will be covered in the uh, obstruents lecture. However, for nasals, the levator palatini muscle is relaxed so that the velopharyngeal port is open. The velum uh, soft palate region is lowered, uh, allowing airflow out of the nasal cavity. This may also happen with active articulation um, by something like the palatoglossus that pulls the uh, soft palate down toward the tongue.
as a result, the nasal consonants all have a similar uh, half-open resonating tube, the tube from the larynx all the way out the nose that has no significant constriction. This gives them a pretty low F1 because that tube is actually longer um, than the tube going out through the oral cavity. It's also the case that the closed off oral cavity, because of the uh, stop-like closure for the different nasals, uh, creates another dead air space that traps sound at the resonant frequency of that oral tract space. So there's generally a gap in the spectrum similar to what we had for L. The location of the gap would depend on the place of articulation, but these kind of uh, anti-formant differences are actually pretty difficult to differentiate from one another. Um, it's probably the case that most speakers uh, in perception differentiate the nasal consonants more on the basis of core articulation with the surrounding vowels and how the formants transition, which will be covered later, uh, rather than on the basis of the nasal itself. The fact that the nasal cavity has all that, you know, stuff in it, um, it's got some sinuses in it that are dead ends, it's generally a kind of a gooey place, um, there's cilia up there and a, a lot of mucus to uh, help warm air and uh, do other functions that the nose does, like have a sense of smell. Um, so uh, generally speaking, nasal consonants are pretty quiet. One other thing that can help us identify a nasal consonant in contrast, in contrast to other consonants is the uh, fact that when you open the velopharyngeal port, you abruptly change what kind of resonating cavities you have by adding an additional tube. So we get a, a kind of an abrupt change in amplitude and also in formant frequencies, whereas generally with other consonants we see more of a continuous transition of formants into and out of the consonant. Okay, so here we have a, the uh, kind of general tube representation of nasal consonants. We have a rather long half-open tube from the larynx out the nose that gives us a relatively low resonance. And then we also have some sort of dead-end tube on the basis of where the closure in the oral cavity is, depending on whether that's at the lips for m, the alveolar ridge for an n, or at the... Uh, um, hard palate for an ng. Here we have spectrograms of uh, the three different nasals, a, uh, ma, a, uh, na, and a, uh, nga. Uh, you can see the abrupt drop off in amplitude as we go from the vowel to the nasal in each case. Can see the relatively low but not real loud first formant inside the nasal in each case. And there are some spectral differences perhaps um, between these different nasals, um, but those differences are uh, um, fairly minor and I certainly wouldn't expect um, any of you or for that matter myself to really be able to identify which nasal we're dealing with on the basis of um, the spectrogram of the nasal. Okay, so putting all this resonant consonant information together, here we have a spectrogram of a syllable, and the question is, at the time point marked by the arrow, uh, what type of resonant consonant are we dealing with? Um, this consonant appears to be sandwiched by vowels on each side, given the relatively prominent looking formants that we're dealing with. Um, that transition uh, into the resonant consonant appears to be continuous rather than abrupt. The formant, uh, such as the second formant example, comes down a little bit or gets slightly lower in amplitude, um, but doesn't abruptly change. The third formant appears to uh, disappear, but we don't see a, um, uh, an abrupt change or lowering in the third formant that might be indicative of an R. Uh, 
Uh, in the case of something like a ya, yeah, we would expect the second formant to get quite high, over 2000 hertz, like it does for an E. So uh, by process of elimination, uh, no abrupt change, so we don't have a nasal. Um, F2 stays low, so we don't have a ya. Yeah. And F3 appears to stay high rather than transition downward and back up, so we don't have a ra. Uh. There is a second resonant consonant in this spectrogram. However, unlike the first one, uh, there is a rather abrupt change in format. Notice how F1 appears fairly loud and then more or less disappears and then reappears again. Uh, that is a classic indication that we're dealing with a nasal. In addition, we have an overall um, kind of abrupt change to a lower amplitude, uh, even lower than the other resonant consonants.